Welcome to the Lynch Rentals Podcast. I'm Ryan Hill. This week, we're wrapping up the year from a video perspective. Lens Rentals product development supervisor Ali Acock Patterson and Lens Pro to Go video producer Dom Boisvert are here to talk about their favorite products of the year, the state of the industry today, and what we hope to see in the future. Ali, Dom, welcome to the podcast. How is it going? Hey, thanks for having me. Doing good. I am well, thank you. I'm glad. Thank you for joining me. We're gonna How are you, Ryan? Right here. I'm good. I'm good. doing well. I, I got my little outline ready to go. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you guys. And what I've decided for this episode, in the past, our end of the year reviews have been very gear heavy, which is fun. People like hearing about that. But I feel like we've done a lot of gear episodes. So while I do have a couple of gear questions, I'm going to get broader industry stuff. I'm excited to talk about the year as a whole. Cool. Yeah, but I will start with gear. So what I want to do, <laughs> I have five Aww. questions written down. I just want to ask you guys one question each. We'll just go around. It'll be easy. That's Wait. not true. Probably. Are we ready? <laughs> I sure. Let's do it. All right. The first, it. and I, I, I phrase this specifically this way because I like to do this this way. It just will make more sense when I read the question. <laughs> What product or products made you happiest this year? And I, you know, I'm I'm not saying what is the best camera we have, but, you know, I, I think at the end of the year, people expect our like favorite products of the year to be like the, I don't know, whatever the $80,000 camera we just bought is. And it, it typically tends to be stuff that's just like, fun and well-designed and easy to work with i i have one i was thinking i'm like hmm like um that um that organization uh show what is she what what sparks joy right that's yeah, marie yeah. kondo <laughs> yeah right exactly that's what that's how i'm trying to approach this um question yeah yeah that's a but good yeah. phrase what 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 sparked joy for you this year product wise i think it was that servo 16 to 35 from sony the t yeah one it was, I, I mean, like I'm a nerd, I'm a video nerd. So servo zooming, servo zooming is just inherently fun to me. Pressing a little zoom rocker and hearing the little ee, ee of the, you know, it's, it's the greatest. And just having like that nice powered zoom, like as a video creator, like you just love that. So, uh, Sony released a cine housed powered zoom lens 16 to 35 for e-mounts uh, obviously that is kind of like in the same realm as its other powered zooms except those were f4 and um had like uh, a much larger range so this is like kind of a short wide to mid-length zoom range for sony i enjoyed this very much because i enjoyed those other sony powered zoom lenses and i really wish i i just shot a um like a sort of mini documentary on the fx9 and fx3 and uh, at one point, that 18 to, I think, 110. Yeah, it's the Sony. Yeah, the uh, F4, F4, is that right? Yeah, F4, 18 to 110. Um, I kept that on the FX9, and I was getting these really lovely powered zoom shots. But I was um, in the wide range of that zoom for most of the time. So if I had this on that shoot, I think I would have been having even more fun. I would have like had uncontainable amounts of fun. <laughs> I feel like it just would have flared better and uh, kind of I was like shooting opposite the light. It was a very flary project. So and the 16 um, to 35 is a two eight, right? No, that's well, it's T three point one. Oh, OK. So it's a little faster. It is a little faster than a four, less fast than two eight. Two eight would have been really, really nice. But the thing is, the thing was, it's kind of a chunky lens already. So I feel like if it was two eight, it would just be like this boulder. But um, no, I had a lot of fun with that. And um, I make the YouTube content for the Lens Protego channel. I've made a video on it. And if you check out that video, you can just practically tell that I'm having fun in there. I'm just zooming. I'm zooming. I'm zooming for no reason. Like the shot doesn't even call for a zoom. I'm like, bam, zoom in. That's good cross so. promotion. We'll link to that video. <laughs> All right. I'm moving. I'm moving on to you. You okay. ready? I Yes. Product that made you happy this year. Um, I... There was just a whole lot this year. I'm going to say the Deity dual channel mic system made me really happy because I wanted something in the building that said Zaxcom on it. Yeah, all right. And on the back of it, it says under patent from Zaxcom. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> For some reason, I thought that was. Uh, I think it's a license related deal. to Aperture somehow, it's, or maybe so. It's the the dual band is. thing is licensed from Zaxcom. The technology to be able to do the dual channel plus recording plus time code from a single wireless transmitter. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm not familiar from, with this thing very I think, broadly. Yeah, I think it's like maybe eight patents that they're working under license from Zaxcom with. And then you are correct. It is also Aperture's audio division. Cool. But I don't know. It was very cool. And I pitched it because we needed something to replace the Sony two-channel system, audio system. And it was like, I heard this says Saxcom and does something cool. Yeah. And then it came in and I realized that like the transmitter or the transceiver itself can do like camera hop and it can pair up to four of itself and do like IFB stuff. I mean, it's just, it's a really, really capable product and it doesn't, the interface isn't quite as exciting. I don't want anyone to get it and think, oh, this is going to be awesome. The interface mm-hmm. is kind of clunky. It's exactly what you'd expect from Aperture's lighting co- or audio division. But yeah. what it can do is pretty impressive. Yeah, that's very cool. How do how is time code handled? Is it just over can, like a three and a half millimeter or I guess it varies? It varies. It has different modes that you can choose either just as a time code source, just as a gem sync source. It can sync itself to other transceivers and send audio with an embedded time code signal. Oh, it, I love that embedded time so code good. is the coolest little idea to me. The tentacle syncs do that. Too, uh, you're you're so smiling. Much. I knew you were going to say the tentacles because you get so happy when I you love, talk about that's them. one of my favorite things we carry. <laughs> yeah, I have not tried this deity thing. I got to check it out. Well, it's awesome. And everyone should. We'll link to that, too. That, so the pros. Is then, that your answer? Sorry, Ryan. Is that your answer for the funnest uh, piece of gear is the tentacle sync? Well, for my part, my I guess I would call this my favorite product of the year. And I'm not, not your sure favorite, if it your was happiest. technically. Yes, my happiest. It make, it brings out the most joy in me. And, it and can't I'm be not the sure if it was again. technically released this year. <laughs> Maybe folds over into last year. I didn't look up the release date, but I first used it this year. And that is the RE Orbiter, which is just real cool. I like it a lot, mainly because it it feels very flexible. I like that it's kind of multiple lights in one and mostly I want more people to rent it from us so we can pick up more accessories for it. Because I think the accessory ecosystem is the coolest part, being able to throw on like Chimera soft boxes and different front elements to adjust the uh, light angle. Uh, I just think it's a really smart, well-designed, like Swiss Army knife of a light that is admittedly kind of expensive, but I think worth the money. Plus, it's waterproof, which is wow. cool. Which light is yeah. it? I totally miss what you said. The RE Orbiter. <laughs> Orbiter. I could see you like I was looking like, forward to something I was like, the anticipation. It's yeah. like, I totally miss the Orbiter part. Yeah, it was at the beginning. Like, the Orbiter. God, the that's Orbiter. a lot of buildup, Ryan. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. I like it quite a bit. Have either of you had a chance to mess with it? We don't have right. a ton, and they, they do go out relatively frequently. They're also huge. They are huge. I've used the case as a step ladder many times. They're big. <laughs> I'm very short, by the way. Uh, I really wish I'd gotten a chance to use it. I've been checking out that thing. I've been like on the uh, Orbiter website like like once a month, like since it's come out. Just like, oh. but no, I haven't got hands on with it. I did just use the L5C, which oh is, yeah, that's not even anything close to the Orbiter. It's like um, what it like what it's aspiring to be. But no, so I would really Orbiter like is it. like the god mode of lights. I think. Totally. It does a lot of stuff. <laughs> it's not like the brightest thing in the world, but it's pretty bright. You can, we don't carry them, but third party manufacturers make uh, brackets that you can like combine four of them into one fixture. It's just the coolest. It costs like five grand. So it's maybe not in everybody's budget, but it's certainly worth it if you need like a light that can do, I won't say everything, but the most things. And sorry, Dom, I cut you off. I apologize. No, I think I well, all I was really going to ask is how do you what's controlling it like? Do you control it off the back of the fixture? Does it have a ballast or control box or there's no ballast. There's no external ballast. That's part of why I think that's part of why it's so big and heavy uh, is because there's not an external power ballast. So you just run power into it four pin XLR. It'll do DMX in and out. Uh, it's also got a handy little. I believe on our site, this is a separate rental, but it's not expensive. A handy little like touchscreen handheld controller that just runs like a a limo cable. So if you want to control it wired, you can do that. A lot of people prefer that over like wireless control, but you can also control it through their apps with like an ad hoc Wi-Fi. So your options are 
pretty much anything. You can do DMX, wireless DMX, Wi-Fi, wired control, or just like the control panel on the physical light itself. It's great. (laughs) It makes you happy. When I think about it, I think about um, all the challenges of shipping it because it is a relatively larger fixture than what I think we are used to. I think people are surprised too, because tell me if this is stupid. (laughs) The shape of it, seeing it without context, like without something next to it for scale, it looks like it would be small. Just the the shape of the thing, because it's like the shape of an Alexa Mini. Right. It's not the shape of like their traditional like cinema M4 lights or something. Like a 10K. Yeah. Yeah. So it it kind of just it looks small. Yeah. I feel like that was not. really good marketing strategy yeah. on their <laughs> end. Like, oh, yeah. If you just see it in like white nothingness on like a B&H page or our product page, I don't, no need to mention B&H. Correct. Um, <laughs> it is. Yeah, it, it looks like it would be the size of an Alexa Mini, but it's the size of probably four Alexa Minis in a big cube. Yeah, I had that exact realization on the products page. Like they show it like in like a black backdrop or like whatever. You're like, oh, cool. Like, look at that. And then they show someone hoisting it up onto a light stand. I'm like, <laughs> whoa. Yeah. And he's like whoa. a ripped guy who's like 12 feet tall. R- right. And exactly. It's like the size they make it look. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he's like struggling. All right. Next question. We're getting, we're getting through these. I'm going to start with Allie this time. What upcoming product releases are you most excited about for next year? I can have multiple answers. No. You can. Uh, <laughs> um, on the one hand, it's the entire Ari signature zoom line. Cool. I but, agree. But on a Allie will actually use it side. <laughs> the DJI uh, Ronin 4D X9 6K or 8K. I'm not going to be picky. Yeah. Anything. Anything that that thing looks truly wild. I'm excited to try it out. It exists in the world. I've seen it on YouTube. We just don't have ours yet. No, we don't have ours yet. And I'm counting the days down because I'm going to make it in my head way cooler than it can ever deliver (laughs) and be severely disappointed. Maybe. But um, I'm really excited about just the whole Zen Muse X9 concept. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's some future products that that might go along with. Like, yeah. The long, incredibly overdue Inspire 3, it'd make a lot of sense if the X9 worked with that. Yeah. I, um, yeah. That seems obvious, hopefully. Hopefully it's also uh, obvious to them. If it's not, and they're listening, y'all should make the Inspire 3, and it should work with the Zen Muse X9. Yeah. But um, yeah, the whole 4D concept, I'm real into the fourth axis that they're throwing in there. And it's really cool. It is very cool. And for listeners who are unfamiliar, we'll link to this if you want to like look at a video or something. But this is basically a mm, Ronin, I guess, but not not like the Ronin 2 or something. It's not it doesn't hold an external camera. It's more like a beefed up version of like the DJI Go. Am I thinking of the right product name? The Osmo, maybe. Yes, the DJI Osmo. That's what I'm yeah. thinking. Of. The it Osmo is... for two hands. Yeah, yeah it's like <laughs> right. a larger yes. two handed Osmo. That's a that's a good way to describe it. Yeah. So, you know, two handed gimbal like the Ronin 2, but the camera is sort of built in, which gives you uh, better leveling or better balancing of the Z axis, which normally isn't. I think. <laughs> yeah, normally isn't accounted for in uh, a traditional two handed gimbal. And it looks insane. Well, it looks so <laughs> cool. Yeah, even if you're not interested in this thing, it's worth just Googling a picture of it because it looks like, I don't know, a chicken spray painted black <laughs> a little bit. It looks so badass and you just killed it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, you know, half half and half. It like I a little bit a little part of me thinks it looks like looks badass. And then when it's being used, like I don't know if you've ever seen a video of someone holding a chicken's body and like moving it around and then their head stays for like perfectly still. Yeah, that's what makes me think of a chicken is the the weird head motion. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. Dom's turn. Dom, what upcoming releases are you excited about? Yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to go with a kind of a straight down the pipe answer and say the flagship mirrorless cameras from Canon and Nikon. Uh, that would be the R3 and the Z6. Z9. Z9. I'm right, so sorry. excited about it. Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, come on. How can you be excited about these? Like, the these mirrorless cameras completely changed the game a couple of years ago, and now the flagship models are coming out. So this is your new Canon 1DX, but mirrorless. This is your 
Nikon D5, but mirrorless, or D6, but mirrorless. And so mm-hmm. that is like, you can't not get excited about that. These video features from the R3, 6K, 60 frames per second raw, 4K, 120, 10 bit internal, 30 frames per second electronic shutter in photo mode, 12 mechanical frames per second. Like, what? The, the Nikon flagship mirrorless is supposed to have um, some of the greatest autofocus that people are experiencing ever. So obviously these haven't come out yet. And so it's kind of strange to make a statement like that. It's going to have the best. I was real excited about the R3 until they dropped the Z9 specs. Right. And I was kind of like, R what? Yeah, <laughs> early <laughs> reviews of both are like very, very positive. You all haven't heard this episode yet because so we have recorded but not yet released an episode. This is getting confusing time wise. <laughs> <laughs> we are recording this episode before we've released our most recent photo gear roundup, which will have aired by the time our listeners are hearing this episode. Does that make sense? Gotcha. Gotcha. So people who have listened to every episode of the podcast will be aware that we recently talked to Barney Britton from DP Review about his like hands on experience with both of these cameras. And the thing that sounded the coolest to me is that he told us the uh, eye tracking autofocus on the R3 is like totally usable and feels like using a camera from the future. Not like tracking your subject's (laughs) eye, but like the R3 will focus on what you're looking at in the viewfinder. I don't know if I feel comfortable with that at all. It's crazy. Yeah, there's a big write-up in DP Review about it. Uh, And yeah, it seems really cool. I'm I'm excited to try that. That sounds like future shit to me. Blade Runner camera. You just made the most I work in consumer electronics comment I've ever heard. It actually... Not only does it have it, but it works. It works. Oh my yeah. god! Because <laughs> yeah, th- this has right. been a feature previously <laughs> in like old versions of the One DX, but it's never really been super reliable. But apparently, it works. I don't know. I'm excited to try it out. 8K30 internally from that Nikon Z9. Yeah. Yeah. 8K video. Well, we have an easy transition from the <laughs> Z9 to my pick. Uh, speaking of 8K 30 frames per second, my choice is I'm excited to try the r5's vr software in combination with the 5.2 millimeter dual fisheye yeah that should be really cool i think that's oh. really exciting and it's very outside of the box for canon yeah it's who very cool stay in a safe spot like, yes also i think the paid subscription thing is going to blow up and they have to have some better not just trial run but light version of yeah. their platform something that is accessible by all people my guess uh, I mean, this is a completely uninformed and <laughs> this is based on no real information optimism <laughs> my guess is that it won't be like a necessity that you will just be able to bring your stuff into like premiere and stitch it's a that 360 way instead. studio <laughs> <laughs> yeah no so hopefully you should be able to i think hopefully at the very least you should be able to avoid canon's software if you don't want to pay the subscription fee and instead want to pay your subscription fee to the nice folks at adobe (laughs) (laughs) but yeah it's exciting and like i think 180 makes more sense than 360 for vr video Mm. Uh, having like seen both uh, one 180 is so much easier you just hide your crew behind the camera instead of just burying cords and hiding behind bushes 30 feet away the technology is easier to deal with. It's much cheaper, but it's also, I think, better creatively. Because I think in 360, at least in like narrative video, you're typically pointing the viewer in one direction kind of anyway. Yeah. There's rarely a situation where you're like, look at everything all around you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, 180 is just easier to view. You still get like some degree of immersion and it still looks really cool. You still have stereoscopic 3d, which I think is the biggest part, but it's just a little bit more focused and so, so, so much easier to shoot that I think more people will be able to make this stuff. Right. And I think with Apple, Apple is supposedly coming out with a VR headset, AR VR slash thing sometime (laughs) in the distant future. I think hopefully that will increase like, I don't know. My fingers are crossed for VR to finally become a thing because it really is it for documentary, especially um, if any listeners are curious to see some of this stuff. The New York Times makes these really, really cool uh, short VR docs that like sell me on the 
usefulness of the medium. Because <laughs> uh, sometimes it's like a weird little stupid parlor trick. But I think in the right hands, it like really adds a lot to a project. And anyway, I think the R5 VR stuff will open it up to people. Next question. We'll get back on track. Uh, this is a very broad question. I'll start with Dom. We're going to punish Dom with this very broad question. Right. How do you think the industry changed this year? Uh, yes, I have one singular and succinct answer that will answer this question thoroughly. And <laughs> no, wow. All right. So, yeah, obviously, it's a big question. What happened this year? Undoubtedly, what we saw was the pent up demand to go back out and shoot again. Uh, we knew it was happening as like actual lockdown was going on. And now so we are, for the most part, opened up and being safe and COVID cautious on our shoots now. And then so what you really saw was people with either everybody in the entire world had a year long break um, from things. So when we came back on the set, we oh, I um I learned this new thing by like uh, all this reading I did like over or all this YouTubing I did. And so. Um, check out this new piece of gear I have or this new technique that I have. Everybody just had like a reset period. And I think that was really informative and also like a much needed break. And then so what we saw this year was just like, yeah, that big pent up demand to like go out and shoot again and to get things done. That's a, exactly right. For anybody who's worried about lens rentals out there, we are busier than we have ever been by quite a large margin. Yeah. And then also, I feel like there are a lot of things just in the general flow of production, too, that are sort of changing, like time, uh, like obviously time management on a film or photo shoot is was already like the utmost priority. But I feel like we're really starting to figure out that like time is money, like hugely. And that that never changed. <laughs> so mm -hmm. but I guess it's just even more important now. Yeah, my my answer to this was very similar to that it, it like there are i think weird little adaptations that people have had to make that some may go away like hopefully long term obviously i, I don't want to speak about this like we're out of it because we're not i think more people will be live streaming and more people will be uh doing like remote cloud-based workflows uh frame ios cloud camera to cloud thing feels like a technology introduced because of the pandemic that could easily stick around and be super helpful well after the pandemic is hopefully over purely because it's good uh, for business and help save time, not necessarily just to keep people from getting sick. Yeah, I think a lot of technology that we probably scooped up, including lens rentals last year, just as a matter of necessity, just to be able to get stuff done by the ever-changing standards and protocols all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've got a basis now of what worked, and now we're just trying to sophisticate things so that they're slightly more elegant solutions because it's like you have this technology that said, like, you know, long, steeped history of film technology that's crashing into all this remote stuff, and it's like, well, how do we do this better? I think at some point yeah. we stopped saying, when do we go back to the old way? And we started saying, when do we make this new technology reflect the production value that we are used to? OK, we'll take a quick break right there. And when we come back, we'll talk about what we want to see in the industry in the future. Want a discount on your next order from Lens Rentals? Head to LensRentals.com slash podcast or follow the link in the show notes for a coupon code. As the largest online photo and video equipment rental house in the world, Lens Rentals has been supplying both professionals and hobbyists for over 15 years. We carry everything from cameras and lenses to drones, computers, even VR headsets, all shipped straight to your door for whatever length of time you need. Rent the gear you need to get the shot and grab a discount at lensrentals.com slash podcast. That's lensrentals.com slash podcast. Welcome back to the Lunch Rentals Podcast. I just spoke with Dom and Ali about how the industry changed this year. So next we'll talk about what happens next year. How do you hope the industry changes next year or broadly in the future? I, and I'll switch back and forth. I'll <laughs> open with Ali this time. Yeah. I hope that we stop taking everyone for granted 
and give people breaks and let people live healthily, even when they're working 12 hour work days Ooh, on film sets. Me this and is Allie have way. similar jobs. My <laughs> answer is almost identical. Yeah. Novel idea. <laughs> yeah. I am. I am not shocked to find that this is your answer. I'm sorry to interrupt. Please elaborate. Okay. I was just excited that we, yeah. I mean, I think working in a state like Tennessee where it's right to work, even union sets that come in, I mean, they're going to hire non-union people who mm -hmm. will keep working so that they don't have to pay penalties for keeping the union people that they brought in from LA or New York. And so it's like 12 hours cut and all the non-union people stick around for another four to six hours and we don't get that 12 hour turnaround. So I always thought it was just kind of the price of doing business in Memphis. That's you know, a really good way of putting it. Like yeah. it was just one of those things where I wanted to do this work and I wanted to do it without having to go live with 12 friends in a studio apartment somewhere in California. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, you know, I just took it as it is. And now that I'm a little older and all the IATSC stuff has come up, it's like, were we maybe standing for something that never should have existed? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I completely, completely agree. And it, coming out of COVID you can draw a lot of comparisons to the restaurant industry. I think people are like, wait, we had to stop this. And then going back to it, all of a sudden you're like, wait, this is pretty fucked up to begin with. Yeah. <laughs> Why are we like this industry needs some profound base level changes that have nothing to do with a global pandemic that are just felt built into the system until the system stopped for a second. And you take a break to think about what we're promoting. Exactly. And go, yeah. the difference is, how did we get away with this for so long? <laughs> I think the vast majority of people have either worked in or at least eaten in a restaurant or from kind of familiar with the way a restaurant works in a Broadway. But I think most people who've seen a movie never worked on a movie set. It's kind of hidden in a way that is like unfortunate. I do think everyone who eats in a restaurant should have to wait tables. I don't think everyone who watches a movie. No. should have to be the no. non-union player no. day player Absolutely on a not. union set. Yeah. <laughs> I would not subject anybody to that. But I would say if you're, you know, a fan of movies, get to know a little bit about how these things are made. And the conditions can be awful, especially, like you said, on non-union sets. This is why I wrote my specific hope. I'm not saying I think this is going to happen because I would be very surprised. I would love to see a PA's union. I, or if not, if not a separate single PA's union, have PA's join IATSE. I was about to say junior IATSE. Yeah, <laughs> I think it would be really good for. I worked as a PA, Ali. I know you've worked as a PA, Dom. I'm not sure if you've ever I, had to do this. I have. Before. Yep. It it sucks. It's awful. You have uh, almost everybody speaking for Tennessee. This isn't always the case, but speaking for LA, New York, Atlanta is larger markets almost everybody on a film set is unionized except for pas uh you'll be subjected to insane turnarounds grueling hours your job is not protected in the same way you're not that, guaranteed pay or uh, right. second meal yes exactly some they'll bring you on for like a day at a time you may not know even at the end of the day if you have a job tomorrow or not and often there are 20 PAs on a big shoot. You know, some of those people will put in their time and work the days to eventually join the DGA or move into IATSE in a more specialized role. But uh, I think PAs deserve a union. And I think film sets would be better <laughs> if everybody had to be treated humanely, not just 90 percent of the people there. I feel like we, we do things in a specialized way, like filmmaking is a specialized thing. Everyone has their specialized role and then PAs get dropped in this general use bucket which is useful in and of itself when everybody has a specified role it is nice to have a sort of multi-purpose multi like hat sort of thing but what they don't tell you is that means countless amounts of miscellaneous tasks that will run you past production hours and will run you past the hours that your call sheet said will run you past the point of exhaustion that yeah, you've never experienced like that. or know was human. Yeah, I knew plenty of people who crashed their cars on the way home from set because they fell asleep because your turnaround rules are not the same. For anybody who's listening to this, a turnaround just means... Um, time you leave to the time you come back. Right, exactly. The time you're leaving set has to be eight hours or 10 hours or whatever. 12 um, hours, I think, is most of the union stuff. Right, yes. So turnaround time, if you're leaving at... 
8 p.m. say your call time the next day cannot be earlier than 8 a.m. if you have a 12 hour turnaround. Unless you're a production assistant. Right. PAs, <laughs> no turnaround. So I've worked long, long. I've gotten off work at 3 a.m. and my call time the next day has been like six or seven. And then you just can't do anything about it unless you want to quit your job. Yeah. Go get uh, a real job like right. normal people, like and everyone yeah. in college told you you should get. Which is yeah. exactly <laughs> what I did. Hello, <laughs> lensrentals.com. But yeah, some some basic protections for the because it, it's it's stuff that would not fly in any other industry. Same as the restaurant industry. There's just stuff you have to deal with that feels built into the system, but really isn't and can be changed just like anything else. And Dom? All right. How how would I like to see the industry change? So I'll talk about it as as a as a media consumer rather than just even a filmmaking person. I want to see some stuff get out of the studio and on the location. I want to see some of these TV shows and movies. I I can only imagine that the that the studio space and the sa- the rent the soundstage rentals are going to be insane because every production is trying to get back up, and um, I assume renting out these studio spaces is going to get insane. So I would I would really really love to see some of these productions getting out on location because I think that just always looks better. Yeah, purely from like a viewing things standpoint, that's like what I want to see. And and also um virtual virtual tours for like um just just doing things like virtually. Now that that dual fish eye lens that you said, that I think is going to be one of the greatest applications of that is um people making videos for virtual tours which I assume just exploded last year and is going to continue to do so this year. It can be done with like a handheld camera and one lens instead of a twenty thousand dollar like very complicated three sixty setup. Totally, and just to float around a house um, in that, and then get a little three sixty slash one eighty video. And there you go. But no, yeah, selfishly, uh, I I just want to see some stuff look better. And most people would say, <laughs> most people would say that is shot in a studio, Dom. But I I kind of disagree like i think just i don't know all the streaming services um content just looks so clean clean and crisp and like video now and i really want to see people like get out we want a little grunge yeah yeah so i I can feel that i'm into that anyways so that's that's it and um i just hope that the industry somehow molds around me getting a really cool um, director of photography gig. There you <laughs> that's, go. The that's dream. how I Fingers hope. Fingers crossed for you, Dom. That's how I hope the industry changes. I hope it just perfectly serendipitously molds around my needs. All right. Last question. I'll get everybody out of here and we'll end on a fun one. So I don't <laughs> have to talk about unions and car crashes anymore. <laughs> what was your favorite movie you saw this year? I love this question. So I'll go, I'll go first. Uh, Cause I have a feeling there is one film of mine, but I have a feeling it might be Ryan's answer. So uh, <laughs> I'll try. I bet not. Then we weird. should make Ryan go first. I'll oh go first. really? Okay. Then, then go for it. Cause mine's, mine's probably the most boring. Any of you heard of Memoria? Mm-mm. I wouldn't recommend it for everyone. It's very slow, but the reason I like it uh, was the weird release strategy. Are you familiar with this, Dom? No. Neon is distributing it. So what they're doing is it will never stream anywhere. Uh, It's not going to any services. We'll never get a DVD or Blu-ray release. It will only ever be shown in theaters. Will only ever be shown in one theater at a time and only for a week at a time. So they're they're hoping to keep it always showing somewhere, but only ever in one theater anywhere in the world. The Indie I mean, Memphis Film Festival played it this year, so I got to see it in a theater, and it's... That's got to keep it cool for at least a little while. It's very, very cool. <laughs> and it, very it, exclusive. I like yeah. that it had... Um, the movie is sort of like... It's very... I don't want to sound pretentious. It's very like poetic. <laughs> There's not a lot of dialogue. There's That's not a thing. lot of plot, even. It's, it's pretty slow. But it's broadly about sort of like building connection between people with like in unspoken ways. If that makes sense. So the the idea of like the only people seeing this thing right now are the people like in this dark room with me. That is really cool. Yeah, I'm really. Into it's, that. Ve- it's very, very cool. 
it's not the most fun movie in the world, but it is like it's worth seeking out for that singular experience. I'm very you mistake happy. me for a fun person. The one who's on vacation. <laughs> yeah, working. check it out next time you go on vacation. So, yeah, I don't know. Look, at, look it up. See where it's playing. I think it's premiering in. I think it's like official premieres in New York uh, around Christmas time. But the Indie Memphis Film Festival, our friends there got a hold of it. It was very cool to see. That is very cool. Memoria. Memoria. How about you, Dom? What was your number one? Number one. Ba -da 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 -da. I have a guess. Yeah, it was Dune. <laughs> Denny Villeneuve. My guess was Dune. Yeah. Um, <laughs> ah, that was my answer. Oh, yeah, I didn't want to take not. anyone's answer. It's such not. like an obvious, like good answer. So honestly, if that was your answer, I can let I can pass the torch over to you. You said it wasn't. It's not. No. Okay. <laughs> mine, mine was directed by Questlove. Oh my <laughs> god! Yes. Yeah. So um, I can only yeah. There's only one. Uh, yeah, and that's all it took. I saw it directed by Questlove, and I was like, "This could be about toenail fungus," and I don't. I will yeah. watch it. It's yeah. not. It's Summer of Soul, and it's about the Harlem Cultural Festival from 1969, and it is so freaking. I saw that too. It was really, 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 it's really good. Really good. Tears the whole time. Like I, I was just uh like happy tears, of course, for anyone that doesn't even remotely know what this is about. It is just such a joyous. It was. It was so incredible. Dune, Dune I have not seen, actually. Yeah. Oh, because I want to see it in IMAX, and I have not been out in public yet. It's absolutely worth seeing in IMAX. You're right to wait. Yeah. So it totally is. And um, try try to do like a matinee or an earlier show. Because there's fewer people. You're so smart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you will not be in that theater with many people. Honestly, my girlfriend and I went to see it in the Boston area, which I don't know how how much that packs in the theaters. But uh, there were 10 people in the theater, maybe. Brand new theater, too. Um, and we didn't even see it that early, too. Just like a couple of weeks after it was Good released. Tip. So that was really, really nice because I also... So like being being in a crowd being in a crowded place like whatever, but like sitting in a little movie box with a bunch of people for two and a half hours is like that's like ugh. Yeah, yeah. I'm there with you. It's a beautiful movie. Part two got greenlit. That's something we can look forward to not next year, but probably the year after, hopefully, fingers crossed. Are they gonna do the rotating directors like Star Wars? Because that would be weird. No, I and think cool. it's Villeneuve again. Oh, we're not gonna get JJ Abrams and uh Michael Bay. No, they're going to bring in George Lucas for Dune Part 2. They're going to give it to Jodorowsky finally. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> He's got the, it's your turn. Um, Dune Part 1, Denis Villeneuve. Dune Part 2, Michael, <laughs> Michael Bay. <laughs> yes. I, for I'd all the kids. Anyway. For all the kids who didn't get it the first time. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Well, thank you both for coming in. We'll wrap it up. Oh, that was it? Yeah, was just having, was just starting to have fun. <laughs> we'll it. start with the movie question next time, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Next cool. time I'll open with that. Thanks for listening to the Lynch Rentals podcast. Everything we talked about on this episode, including the movies, will be linked to in the show notes. So be sure to take a look at those if you want any more information. As always, make sure to visit lynchrentals.com slash podcast for a discount on your next order from us. And if you're enjoying the show, you can support it by subscribing and giving us a review on Apple Podcasts. We're on Instagram and Twitter at Lens Rentals, and thanks to Jacques Granger for our theme music. More of his work can be found at revengebodymemphis.bandcamp.com. On the next episode of the Lens Rentals podcast, we'll tackle the year in review from a photographer's perspective. I'll be talking with Joey Miller, Zach Sutton, and Roger Sakala all about their favorite gear of the year and what they hope to see in the future on the next episode of the Lynch Rentals Podcast. Mm -hmm.